how was that break? So we're going to talk a little bit about Antonio Gramsci uh, and cultural hegemony. Now, basically, what the fuck is this? Um, it's just an idea about ideas. I mean, that's all that philosophy is. And uh, his idea w w was this. The dominant ideology, right, the, the hem hegemonic sort of view, right, um, was, was, was basically something that would, was not forced upon people. So again, what we viewed as normal, as right, as wrong, uh, within a society, um, again, these things, the, I, these ideologies or this hegemony, right, uh, or hegemonic ideas often reflected the interests of the ruling class, right? Um, uh, but, you know, it wasn't upon force. Force, you know, forcing people to believe your ideas maybe doesn't work. You have to, like, kind of, like, lube it up and, you know, you know, kind of finesse your way in there, a little foreplay uh, in, in, in the action to get people to sort of accept those things, to believe in them, to think that they are actually normal. Forcing people to believe stuff maybe is not the best way to have people to do what you want. You got to kind of trick them, bait them in a little bit. Um, and so basically he was interested, his concept of cultural hegemony was to basically look at how the ideas of the ruling class, right, um, were accepted as reality that you know oh yeah we need to we need to go to work we need to um, obey laws we need to marry and reproduce um, we need to go to school we need to go to college like how do all these things right that reflect the interests of capitalism and the ruling class which is not us sorry we're all peasants um, you know how does that normalize and become accepted as the truth within society um, and and he 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 really was heavy on like the idea that there is no actual truth that truth is socially constructed and people need to be able to deconstruct it and his concept to this and what he brought to the table was like the only way that we can you know challenge these ideas is through uh, you know um, uh, counter hegemony, this sort of subversive view that challenged the ruling class of, of society and their views and viewpoints, and to subvert those concepts and those ideas and to ridicule them and to do it in a way that wasn't maybe academic, to do it in a way that the common, common people could understand, that you, you could have these organic intellectuals. <coughs> you know, that um, didn't put themselves on a pedestal that could communicate to us peasants, you know, unlike Karl Marx, in a way that we could kind of all understand and we could kind of like see it. So I think that's kind of like talking a little bit about his concept of, 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 of hegemony and counter hegemony. So I think what, what I like to really look at, um, you know, when we think about South Park is how is South Park, how does it reflect the, the, um, reflect and challenge, you know, dominant ideology and the ideas of the ruling class and, and how does it break it down and, and, and you know, in some ways uh, break it down and comment on ruling ideas and sort of expose them? How is South Park organic intellectuals, as he would call them? Or how is South Park, like, you know, reinforcing dominant ideas within society, which they, they also do? So that's just a little bit about theory and all that stuff. I mean, it's kind of like, holy shit, just just chill, you know, with that, but, uh, you know, kind of just wanted to break that stuff down a little bit, just sort of simplify it, um, you know, because these are like, you know, old ideas, but they're often commonly referenced in a lot of, like, new scholarship, even if not, like, outwardly, um, inwardly, and I think, you know, if we look at our current pandemic, and we look at everything, kind of, it's really interesting to look at it from both these both these perspectives, you know, how is truth being manufactured, truth about the virus, truth about behavior, truth about the economy, um, etc. And, and what's the role of the ruling cat class in manufacturing, manufacturing this truth and normalizing it? It's just something to really always kind of consider. So if we want to talk about social class, um, it kind of breaks down into, you know, five or six categories, okay? So we have, um, we have, again, the underclass, these are people who are not making any income, um, who aren't working at all, 
um, which is a lot of people now. This used to be about 12% uh, in the United States. Um, we move up a little bit, then we have the working poor. These are basically people who um, are working, households that are working, um, but do not make enough combined total income to uh, be above the poverty line. That's about 13%. We have a large pocket of American society, 30%, which is the working class. This is, again, um, what you call like blue collar laborers, people who, again, they're above the poverty line, maybe living, probably living paycheck to paycheck, um, and they're working for, you know, creating value for the capitalist, you know, whatever you want to think about, creating surplus value for, for someone else. We then move up to the next uh, ilk, which is the middle class or lower middle, lower middle class. This is, about, again, about 15, uh, 30% of the population. That brings us up to the upper middle class. Uh, um, you know, people, there's about 15%. And you total all that up, and that gets us to 99%, which leaves us with the 1%, the capitalist or ruling class. And if you even want to break that down even more, we can break it down to the 0.01% that has the most wealth uh, in the world. In fact, most of the wealth in the world. If you've watched the videos and seen this, you know that you know wealth disparity or wealth inequity is a major, major social uh, issue. Um, um, and it's important to note too what the difference is between wealth and income. So income is the wages that you earn. Wealth is what you have in physical property, um, liquid assets, uh, stock investments or, or whatever. That's actual wealth. Income is different. That's the wage that you, that you earn. Okay, there's another slide or part of the slide that breaks it down um, that, you know, the super rich, you know, which is basically anybody who makes above 350000 you know. Um, but again, this is such a small portion of the, you know, top 1%, 1% you know, is uh, uh, the smallest portion of the 1% is those who have the most, um, etc. But you can work through that, you know, the working class. It breaks, breaks, breaks down. Um, you know, how much you make if you're in the working class, if you're in the working poor, etc. Um, to give you the most updated U.S. poverty stats, these are from 2018. So about 38.1 American million Americans live in poverty, which um, is 11.8% poverty rate, which is actually down 3% since 20, 2014. Uh, but who knows now? Nah, that shit, This shit's all out the fucking door. Um, so who fucking knows at this point? Uh, the poverty line for a family of four is considered about $25,700. And then for one person is $13,000. So if you, um, if you make under 13 grand, you, you, you know, you're in the, you know, the poor poverty class, um, in society, uh, you know, racialized, you know, to think about this in the United States, um, Asian Americans have the highest income and lowest poverty rates and African Americans have the, uh, the, the lowest income and the highest poverty rates. So there is you know, racial disparity that goes in, into all this and there's lots of um, information that breaks that down, those demographics down even more, um, you know. But, I mean, we're seeing this all kind of play out now. Um, we're seeing how race and class play into this disease, um, testing, treatment, uh, how it's class, you know, racialized. It's based on class, um, uh, you know, who can get treatment, who can't get treatment, health insurance. I mean, all that stuff is really, uh, it plays out in, in things like in things like this labor. I mean, you look at, you know, uh, people working in meat processing plants who are now coming down with, you know, COVID-19. Um, and, you know, these are low-wage workers, um, essential low-wage workers, you know, who are putting themselves at risk so we can eat, um, you know. And so that's largely a class-based thing, you know. A lot of uh, those workers can't afford to not work, just like a lot of people can't afford to not work. They're already in the working poor, you know. Um, but to give you a little sense, you can see the, the triangle of, of global st statistics. So just to kind of look at this, you know, um, you know. I mean, I mean, I look at this and it just makes me incredibly, 
incredibly sad. Um, uh, but you can see the wealth range, right? Like a million dollars puts you in the one percent. You know, and you see how small that is, right? That's just incredibly small, right? The wealth range, you look at like the 36 million people that have over a million dollars, right? Represent 0.7% of the world's population, right? People earning under $10,000 represent 70% of the world's population. So globally, Right, you look at like wealth inequity, and it's the the statistics are even fucking way way more crazy. Um, people that earn between ten and a hundred thousand dollars a year, right, is eleven percent of the world's uh, you know population. I mean, twenty one percent of the world's population. It's just bananas, right? And then own, earning between a hundred and a million dollars a year, you have eight percent of the world's population. So it gives you just gives you a sense, you know of uh, how bonkers it is and yeah that that uh 0.7 percent owns over 46 percent almost 46 percent of the world's wealth i mean think about that it's fucking bananas it's depressing okay so you can see all these child world poverty statistics which you don't want to look at because it's just fucking depressing all right god we're all fucking peasants you know it's just, damn all right so the one percent in the united states uh, and I'll go over two slides on this and then we'll, we'll take a break and then we'll get into, um, you know, a little bit of, uh, the episode 1%. Okay. So in the United States, if your income is more than $300,000 per year, you're considered in the 1%. That, that's a lot of money to make in a year, but it's not that much money, right? It's, it's, that's a lot. I mean, that's a, a lot of, a lot, a lot of money. But it's not that much money if you re you know you really think about it. that puts you in in the one percent. So it makes you think any the ninety nine percent is anybody under three hundred grand, which is a lot of motherfuckers in there. You know, uh, this one percent has about thirty five percent of uh, of the private wealth, right? And then the next nineteen percent, right? You know, if we talk about class warfare, the next nineteen percent has about 54% um, of the world's wealth. So you have, I mean, of the United States' as wealth. So you have like, you know, almost 90% of the United States' wealth in, in, in the top 20% of the population owning it. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's crazy. That leaves 10%. To the rest of us peasants, you know, of the of the wealth. Okay, so 89% of the wealth in the top 20% population. That's just fucking crazy. Okay. Everybody else gets the the last 11%. These are wage workers, or an hourly hourly wage, salary workers, etc. Half of America holds about 1% of the country's wealth. There's 66,000 Americans who have a value over $20 million, okay, wealth of $20 million, and 1.8 million who have a worth net worth of over $2 million. Okay, again, those, that's wealth, not, not income. But here's the deal, yo, and you kind of know this, right? Like, income... And wealth has not increased as productivity has increased. So, like, American productivity, like, the amount of work we do and the amount of time we spend, wor spend working in the last 40 years has gone up 80%. Okay, 80%. We work that much harder. But the income, how much we earn, has not even touched that shit. Okay, and, and the slide kind of illustrates it, but, like, yo, if, like... Wages kept up with the economy, like the average wage would be 92 grand. Not bad. I'd be fucking hyped on that. Okay. Um, now it's important to note the one percent uh, pays a much higher tax percentage, so that they get taxed uh, out of a lot 
you know, a higher amount, like a higher percentage of their, of their income. But the 99%, the rest of us pe peasants pay the majority of the tax revenues. I mean, we already know all these bastard, billionaire bastards who don't pay a fucking penny. You know, if you've seen the, uh, the Jeff Bezos fucking um, rice, the dude who uses rice to illustrate wealth, it's crazy. It's just crazy and not paying any taxes, okay? Um, the other important thing is that this 1% only has about 5% of the entire debt in America. So most of these motherfuckers don't have debt. Obviously, right? So we have 99% we have not, of the people have 95% of the world of the United States' debt. Okay, 400 people have more wealth than 155 million of us. Awesome. Okay, and this is this is disgusting. 85 richest people are as the 85 richest people, right, are as wealthy as the poorest half of the world. That's 3.6 billion people. So 85 people have the same amount of wealth as 3.6 billion motherfuckers. Oh man, anyways, I hope you're all right. Don't let that get you down, you know what I'm saying? Get you up, go take a walk, enjoy yourselves for a few minutes. I'm gonna re-up, recoup, and we'll come back. We'll talk about Occupy Wall Street in episode 1%.